Uh, the sermon for this evening is based on uh, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 52 and 53. Uh, the sermon is entitled, Joyfully Lutheran, the second article of the Creed, Redemption. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't we all love the Creed? Dwelling upon what God has done for us, creation, redemption, and sanctification. Now, last week we spoke of God's powerful creation and how he gives us all things by his powerful and creative hand. Now, this week as we continue on in our book of Joyfully Lutheran, uh, we see now we embark on this second article of the Creed about Jesus, the redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Now, when we confess these words in the Apostles' Creed, I always make it a point for myself and for everyone I tell that we should really take it slow. Take this Apostles' Creed a little bit slow, slow it down a little as we weave through the important words that have gone throughout our history. The words that point to Christ, who He is and what He has done for humanity but also especially for you. And we hear those words all the time, right? The Apostles' Creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, died, and He was buried. He descended into hell the third day. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in Jesus Christ. It is those words that we dwell upon the mercy of God and his sacrificial action for each and every one of us. Now, the glory of the Catechism is that it shows us. As we read the second article of the Creed, it gives us those explanations, right? And the explanation to the second article is read like this. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. That is my Lord. Born of the Virgin Mary, all by the Holy Spirit conceived. And here we see... Why does he have to be our Lord? The explanation continues. Who has redeemed me? Who am I? A lost and condemned person. That's who I am. Purchased and won from all sins, for I cannot purchase things, this sin for myself, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his, not just any suffering, but his innocent suffering and death, and that is Jesus's. So that, why does Jesus do all this? So that I may be his own. That is the measure in which God comes to us. So that we could be his own. And as his own, we live under him in his kingdom. And serve him, how? In everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he has risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all of eternity. And this is most certainly true. You know, every night we, um, with the kids, I know it's been a habit of ours, but every night we, we say the Apostles' Creed together, and, and sometimes I find them saying it too quickly, and I say, you know what, slow down. Let's dwell upon these words, because I think when we look at the second article of the Creed especially, what a, what a glorious picture, right? The floodgates of God's grace outpoured unto all of us because we need God's grace, and he gives it to us by his free gift, that sacrifice. And here we find who our Lord is. Now Harrison writes, and I, I kind of mentioned this in Bible study in the morning, but Harrison writes in his book, I think on page 69 of, uh, of Joyfully Lutheran, he says, today, when many Christians state, when they say, Jesus is Lord, they may have the law in their view, that they say that Jesus is your Savior, but have you made him 
your Lord. And Harrison quickly writes um, that it's all about your obedience and works. But the question is, what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? Do we make him our Lord or how does that work, right? I mean, Luther writes, when it comes to what it means that Jesus is Lord, it is this. He says, he has redeemed me from sin, from the devil, from death, and from all evil. For before I did not have a Lord or king, but was captive under the devil's power, condemned to death, stuck in sin and blindness. Without the true Lord, we're stuck with the false lords of this life, the false gods, the ones that call us to be deceived and to go against and turn away from God. But there the Lord is. When we recite the second article of the creed, we dwell upon who our true Lord is and what He has done for us. It is not about your obedience. It is not anything we do to make him Lord, but, but it is because he is the Christ. That is why he is the one true God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because there we very well know in our spiritual DNA, the sin and separation, the fall in the garden. We very well know that we need Jesus as Lord. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And thus, as we confess our faith, remember the creed is our faith. What we believe is found in that creed. And when we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord, what are we really saying there? I think in one way, we are confessing that we never or there never will be another Lord like what Jesus has done for us. That we need the Lord outside of ourselves. For if we are the Lord of life in our own humanity, in our own flesh, we know that we fall short. That when we try to be the Lord of our life, wow, we find ourselves caught up in the sinfulness of our flesh. When we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, what we are saying is that I cannot save myself from sin. I cannot rescue myself from death and the power of the devil. I cannot overcome the separation from God. There is no ascending on this springboard of morality or emotion. We cannot outwit the devil ourselves. Nor can we cross over from death to life by self resuscitation. When we say, I believe in Jesus, we're really saying we play no part in the redemption. We have no credit or merits in this buyback work because we know that in ourselves, in ourselves, the wages of sin is death. For every sin, every gossip, every ill thought, every source of envy or jealousy or strife, idolatry in our lives, the wickedness of sin, every skeleton in the closet, every covetous thought, every pride-filled, me-centered temptation. There we find ourselves as the law is written on our heart. And indeed, we are broken. We are the chief of sinners. But at the same time, when we say Jesus is Lord, when we say and confess, I believe in Jesus Christ, we confess what he gives, his name. You will name him Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. We confess Christ. The virgin shall bear a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. We confess the Christ, the anointed one set apart to be the Savior of the world. And this is your Lord. Don't you see? God is with you by his very word. And he shows us in this very word that Jesus is Lord. 
for you. He is your Lord by his grace, the one who is marred beyond human semblance, the one who is despised and rejected by men, the one who has surely borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, the one who is wounded for our transgressions and, and crushed for our iniquities. All the meanwhile, we like sheep have gone astray, everyone turning to their own way, yet the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And in the midst of who we are, there Jesus went. He saw the shears like a lamb who was going to the slaughter, yet he was there silent. I believe in Jesus Christ. This is who your Lord is. The one who goes to the cross to be the redemption price. He sees your sins. And there he sees the costs, and that is his body and blood shed for you. His crucifixion lifted high upon the tree. There is your Lord who is finishing salvation for you, enduring obedience upon that cross, just so that he and we can say that Jesus is Lord, the one who knew no sin but became sin for us. And because he is Lord, because he is the one true Lord, yes, he died, just as he predicted, for the sins of the world. And though this grave should have kept him down, it is Jesus who stares straight at death and says, nope, you're not going to overcome me. I overcome death. Death loses its sting. Death is swallowed up all by what Jesus has brought. And that is he, our Lord, defeats death. And no wonder in the upper room, Thomas marks on the side, marks on the hand. My Lord, my God, those are his words, the resurrection. This is our Lord the one who rises on the third day, who accomplishes salvation for us, so that when we say, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord, what we are saying is that I am forgiven of my sins because he has accomplished the work all by way of his death and resurrection, and he covers and washes and makes me wide as snow as he cleanses me and purifies me all by his body and blood daily. What a great gift this is to confess. And through life's struggle, flesh and sin, the power of the devil, continue to lurk in the shadows, waiting and attacking at every weakness, every angle, every temptation, wave after wave. Even at times so unrelenting it becomes. But remember who is your Lord. The one who says, from the offspring of a woman will be the savior of the world who will crush the head of Satan. He is crushed. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because Jesus is Lord, there he answers your prayer. It really puts ourselves into place. Yes, we do a lot of good things for the Lord, But when we confess Jesus Christ, those works mean nothing in light of our salvation. It is the forgiveness of sins given by our Lord that there we find the sufficiency of the cross and the empty tomb. Because there we see our Redeemer King. The sacrifice, the one who stood in our place to say, yes, I have eternal life, I have forgiveness, I have salvation, because Jesus is my Lord. And there, as we struggle with our sin and the Lord calls us to repentance, there we say, I believe that Jesus is Lord. And thus, by his lordship, as a good shepherd, he leads you to the still waters. His precious blood, you are covered. Jesus won you. He won you. He saw you and he says, I need them. I'm going to win them by the crucifixion. And there he went. So that now, what does it say in the catechism? It says, you go serve. How do you serve? 
in everlasting righteousness. See that? That's who you are. You're, you're serving in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. That's what Jesus has done for you. That this truth has set you free. I believe in Jesus Christ. The love of God has given you, has imparted to you his righteousness, his innocence, and his blessedness. And through all things, yes, as we still fight the old Adam in us, the flesh, the sin, the temptation, there we flee to Christ, Jesus, where he gives you the assurance that he is Lord, the one who has gathered you, the one who has died and rose for you, the one who has marked you as holy, righteous, innocent, set free, and forgiven of all of your sins. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Midweek Sermon from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorepark.com dot com.